everyone back with another episode of Stuff and Things. Today I'm sharing a little bit of a story with you guys about probably one of the most dangerous situations that I've been in while traveling around in the sat van. Now this happened about two days ago. My dad is in town in Colorado visiting and I wanted to go out and show him the mountains. We were gonna go on a little bit of a camping trip in the van and things were going as planned. I started filming a video like normal. We were planning on going up to Breckenridge. We were gonna check out the town for a little bit and then I know of a camping spot nearby so we were just gonna go out and camp in the van that was until things went sideways very, very quickly. So this happened two days ago. We left the house around nine o'clock in the morning and we were heading up I-70 with some not so great weather. On our way up, it was snowing. I was aware of it. The trip was gonna take a little bit longer, but it wasn't something that I was really worried about. The van has four wheel drive. I just got brand new tires on there. So we were just gonna sort of take our time heading up I-70. Now, if you're not familiar with Interstate 70 going through Colorado, essentially it is the major highway that runs from east to west, goes up through the mountain, over mountain passes, and it's honestly not the safest road to drive on in general, especially during snow. There's a lot of heavy truck traffic and just a lot of vehicles, especially when you get closer to the weekends. People are going up there to ski. Luckily, this happened midweek, so there wasn't a whole lot of traffic, but it was still pretty damn dangerous. So we're traveling up through the mountains. We're passing Idaho Springs, which is roughly about like the halfway point. And then we're getting up closer to the Eisenhower Tunnel. And that is the point where I-70 often closes when there's a lot of snow on the roads. But again, it was snowing, the roads weren't too terrible, and we were just making our way like normal. Now we're driving uphill majority of this time and all of a sudden my check engine light comes on. I don't think I've ever had my check engine light come on in the van while I was just driving around like that. So immediately I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. At this point on 70, it's two lanes. I'm in the right hand lane. There is a guardrail on my right side and there are cars passing me on the left side. There's no pull off on the right side, but on the left side in between the two lanes of the highway, there is a safe spot to pull over there and I just didn't have enough time to even like react to get over in between all of the vehicles and get my van into a safe spot. So we're doing about 60, 65 miles an hour uphill. The check engine light comes on and immediately the power just drops to the van and I was like oh no this is not good immediately turn the four ways on and the van is just slowing down pretty quickly the van's super heavy about like 9,000 even probably a little bit over 9,000 pounds and by the time I could even like check my mirrors and signal that I was trying to get over the van comes to a complete dead stop in the right lane of Interstate 70. So I'm butted up against the guardrail as far over as I can possibly get over and the van just dies. Every single light on the dashboard comes on and it's just completely dead. Now I'm freaking out a little bit because there's a ton of trucks and other vehicles coming up behind us pretty damn quickly. Again, snow on the road and I'm sure there was some patches of ice. So basically I was just staring in my mirror with our seat belts on, obviously trying to remain safe here. And I'm just praying that no one is going to come up and just slam into the back of the van. So immediately as the van dies and we're just stopped in the middle of this interstate, I'm cranking the van and there's power going to the motor and I can hear it cranking. It doesn't sound like too terrible, but it is not starting. So after trying to crank it like two or three times and just sitting there in a super dangerous spot, I ended up calling 911. This is probably only the second time that I've ever had to call 911 in my life. Talked to the operator and I said, hey, kind of an emergency situation. We're blocking traffic on I-70. There are cars flying all around us and I'm in a terrible situation. I cannot get the van any further off the road. It's too heavy to push to even get it to the other side. And with all the snow and vehicles coming, we were just kind of like sitting ducks there hoping to not get hit by a tractor trailer. Now this is not the safest thing to do, but I did have a bunch of flashlights with me. Of course, I carry one in my pocket every single day and I had some more in the van. So once it was safe and there were no vehicles coming past us, we ended up hopping out and sort of were signaling traffic. We just had two flashlights. My dad had one and I had one and we were just kind of shining it at people saying like, hey, we're broke down here. There's nothing we can do. So like, please move to the side. There was only one like really close call. A tractor trailer came flying up on us and I don't know if he just didn't see us till the last minute or if he was just 
kind of disregarding everyone else's safety, but he passed the van like very close, within a foot doing probably like 50, 60 miles an hour. And it was just not a good situation. I've been stuck in the middle of Death Valley and that was not even as dangerous as being completely stopped on I-70 in the snow. So now to speed up the story a little bit, after talking to the 911 operator, I explained my situation. I told him where we were roughly, like the mile marker we were at. And after 20 to 30 minutes, we finally had help come. We were sitting there and I was just kind of like, Oh, just super anxious. I was like, man, if someone hits us right now, it's just not gonna be good. I think luckily because of the snow, vehicles were traveling a little bit slower than normal and I think they could see us because we were in a decently straight line. Obviously, I'm here to tell the story and the van is okay, so no accidents happened. But the response time was very slow. Finally, someone from CDOT came out, had a light bar on top of his vehicle, parked maybe like 50 yards behind the van and was directing traffic out of our way. Another 10 minutes after that, a police officer came up, I believe it was like the highway state patrol. So while the guy from CDOT and the police officer were there sort of directing traffic, the CDOT guy came around me and we hooked up a tow strap onto my front bumper and he pulled us not even like 500 yards, it was probably 250 yards up the rest of this hill and there was an exit right there. So we were so close to being safe this whole time, but it just didn't work out. So then five minutes later, tow truck comes up behind us and then pulls in front and begins to load the van onto the wrecker. And this part was pretty impressive because the van is super heavy. The tow truck driver asked me, he's like, I can't tell if this is super heavy or if it's just really cold. I should also mention that it was about like 14 degrees when we left the house in the morning. It was eight degrees when we got stranded and the temperatures were dropping. It got down to negative six that night. So freezing cold temperatures, not a great environment for diesel vehicles. So as he's about to load the van up, we're kind of like troubleshooting and just racking our brains. I sort of ruled out the electrical because I sat there on 70 cranking the motor time and time again and there was still power going to it. I just recently replaced a secondary alternator belt so I thought that could have been the issue at first but because it was cranking I was like nah that can't be it. Now just as we pass Idaho Springs right before we broke down I had about a quarter tank left and at a quarter tank the reserve fuel light comes on, which means you generally have about 100 miles to go. So I knew I was okay on fuel, but one thing, and this is like a major lesson learned, especially in the winter months, one thing that I always try to do is keep the tank above half, and you guys will see why that was important here in a little bit. So he started loading the van up and he was like, where do you wanna go? And I was like, I guess Mercedes back down near Denver. We weren't super far away and I was actually surprised with the quote that he told me. He said it would probably cost me about 450 to $500 to take the van all the way back basically to where we came from. I was almost at a loss at this point. I was like, yeah, I guess let's just take it back. But then I thought about that fuel thing. I was like, well, if I had 100 miles left, maybe I just got some bad fuel. It is the winter time, it is super cold out here. So I asked him, I was like, can we just swing by the closest gas station so I can fuel up and maybe even put some additives in it? The tow truck driver actually suggested picking up some diesel 911, which is a fuel additive, which will hopefully prevent gelling. So I was like, yeah, let's just stop at a fuel station and see if I can get this worked out. So not even like half a mile down the road, we pull into a Sinclair. I started filling up the van. I filled it up to about half. My dad ran into the gas station, found some diesel 911, and I poured a little bit too much in. One of those jugs can generally treat like 100 gallons of fuel, and I was only putting in about 25. So I got a little bit uh, generous with the amount that I was putting in the tank. And then after adding that, I filled up the tank the rest of the way. Keep in mind the van is still on the back of this wrecker at the time, so I climb in, crank it over one time, it dies, crank it over one more time, and it starts up. So I was super thankful at this point. The tow truck driver was super cool. Shout out to uh, Scorpion Towing up in Idaho Springs. So he dropped the van and he was like, I'm just gonna hang out here and grab some lunch if you guys wanna drive around and then come back just to make sure the van is okay. So did a lap up the road, came back. My check engine light is still on at this time, but the van is running 
pretty much like normal. So because the new fuel and that additive worked, it basically narrowed down to a fuel related problem, either the fuel pump or the fuel filter or something with the fuel rails. So the van was running okay, I paid for the tow. He luckily only charged me a hundred bucks to go like half a mile to the gas station. I didn't even care what the price was. I was just super thankful that he was there to help us. So from where we broke down, I then drove to Owl Off-Road, which is a new branch of Owl Vans, which is in Arvada, Colorado. Huge thank you to them because we're going to be heading there in a little bit. We ran some diagnostics on the van and my check engine light was throwing codes for basically low fuel pressure in the rails. We cleared those codes out and everything was running fine after that. So I drove home and decided that we needed to replace the fuel filter. So at this point, we sort of troubleshot down to the fact that I was not completely out of fuel, but if I had bad fuel and I still had 100 miles to go, it was so cold that the remaining fuel in the tank, there was a small enough amount of it that it probably gelled up. And this has never happened to me before. I've camped down to like negative four when I was up in Jackson Hole before and I never had any issues. But the van is getting a little bit older. We're sitting at around 61,000 miles right now and this is really only the second chassis issue that I had. The other chassis issue I had was with the DEF systems. You guys know I hate DEF systems on all vehicles. I understand their importance for the environment and stuff like that, but they are nothing but problems. So Mercedes fixed that under warranty, and then this new problem is something that was probably just bound to happen at some point. So I narrowed down the issue to being a little bit too low on fuel. Keep your tanks above half if you're driving around in the winter time, especially with like sub-freezing weather. A combination of also bad fuel. I must have gotten fuel at a low diesel volume gas station. If you're not going to a truck stop to pick up diesel and they're not constantly refueling their tanks then that diesel will sit in there for a while it can accumulate condensation so there was probably condensation in the gas that I got or the fuel I should say and then also of course the freezing cold temperatures so the next step was to go to Mercedes pick up some parts to replace the fuel filter and that's what I'll show you guys right now all right guys, now it's time for a fix. I got the van in here at a new Owl shop, Owl Vans. This place is known as Owl Off-Road out here near Arvada, Colorado. So we're just gonna get right into thrashing. First thing we're gonna do is remove all my snorkel intake, the air box, and the fuel filter that we're trying to get to. It's located right about there where my light is. So. Got some hose clamps and stuff to take off over here. We'll remove this power cable. And over here we have brand new five pin. This is gonna vary depending on your sprinter. Most of them around the 2018 are five pin. Got a new intake gasket and then some little fuel line clamps. I don't have the tool for those, so might run into a little snag there, but let's just get right into it. Air box is out. Now I'm gonna be a little bit careful doing this because I have to take off this intake hose here from the front of the turbo. That way I can just get better access down inside of here. That is where the gasket will be going into place, but this is still hot because I just pulled into the shop, so might have to sit here for a little bit. Now down inside here on the fuel filter, I already removed the plug from here. There's a little clip around this hose clamp, which I'm going to try to not drop into the engine bay. Then I'm gonna have to actually cut these two hose clamps for the fuel lines. And then there's a few bolts here, I believe it's three, and I should be able to pull this thing right out. All right, so the old fuel filter is out right here. I just sort of cut those clamps off and they're hanging on these hoses here. There were three bolts holding that into place and now there's also this collar on here which I'm gonna have to transfer from the old filter over to the new one. Now as I'm taking this collar off, you wanna make sure that it is in the same position as this, that way the hoses will line up. So looks like the valve coming off of the sensor here is right in between these two. It's probably gonna be a good idea to test fit this as well, just to make sure everything lines up. But I'm gonna eyeball it from here. That looks pretty good, it's about the same. Now I'll do a quick test fit after taking off these little caps. So this is one thing that you guys don't wanna do, the little clip 
for one of the fuel lines here. It's a tiny little plastic brittle piece and mine snaps so I might be able to squeeze at least one of the sides in to hold it on to this little o-ring here. Should be fine, right? All right, and just like that, we're all back together. I didn't really film putting this all back together because it's kind of tight in here. But as you can see down there, the new fuel filter is in place. All of the hoses are reconnected. I zip tied where I broke that little plastic clip. So yay, zip ties. I used a pair of pliers to get those clamps back on and they just kind of snapped together. So it worked really well. Air box is back on. Everything is all connected, minus this clip. Ooh. Now everything is back together. Time to fire it up. I think that little hesitation was just the new fuel filter priming. Hopefully it's not leaking. Something's leaking. <laughs> spraying everywhere. Oh, dude, it was that little clip. God damn it. My dad's gonna start it, so in case it explodes again, I can tell him to cut it. I'll explain the fix here in a second. Let's just make sure this doesn't explode. Rev it up a little. All right, so we got this thing fixed. That clip that I thought might not be a big deal, fix it with a zip tie. It was a big deal. And instead of buying a little clip, you have to buy this whole line here, which I thought was a fuel line, but on the other end of this, it runs across the engine here and then basically just turns into a breather valve, which uh, right here is the end of that valve. So to be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure the whole point of this thing. I'm sure it serves some purpose, but it's all fixed now. I very gently pulled the clip off of here. It's not easy to do. Mercedes probably wants you to replace this whole line because they're just sort of press fit into place onto the actual filter. So that's it, should be fixed and hopefully no more issues after this. So now that brings us back to today. The van is hopefully fixed. I don't have any like huge trips planned throughout the rest of the winter time, but I will try to drive it more regularly. That way I can keep replenishing with better fuel and hopefully no more issues. Knock on wood. I'm going to hopefully be like doing a complete refresh of the van throughout the spring. There really shouldn't be any more chassis related issues because sprinters are for the most part bomb proof. I'm not exactly sure if Mercedes replaced my fuel filter the last time I had it in for service, but I'm probably going to start to take the servicing of the van into my own hands because the van's just getting older. I can do it myself for a lot cheaper. As long as I have a garage to do it, the sat van obviously does not fit in my garage. So huge thank you again to Al Off-Road for allowing me to come to your shop. Shout out to John for sort of squeezing my van in the side there and let me work on it while he was working on some other things. I appreciate you guys. I'll leave a link for Al Vans in the description down below as well. But yeah, I'm gonna take the matters of servicing the van as much as I can into my own hands and hopefully I can get this thing like super dialed in and bomb proof this spring and summer. That way next winter, I won't run into all of these issues that I've been having. I know we just beefed up some of the water lines, but I'm thinking that once it's warm out, I'm going to rip all of the water lines out and completely replace all of that. So you may see a video on that in the future. And this is just one of the joys of owning a home that you can drive around the country, rolling down the road at like 70 miles an hour. Things of course are gonna go wrong. I just wish it wasn't happening so close to each other. So anyway, that's it. Make sure you get good fuel in the winter time if you're driving a sprinter van or any kind of diesel vehicle for that matter. So get quality fuel, keep your tank above half, that way you don't run into this same issue and hopefully you guys learned something throughout this video. If you did, I would appreciate it if you left a like. I'm alive, so maybe a like for that, that's cool. Leave some comments down below if you guys have any questions on replacing the fuel filter on a Sprinter van. Most of them are pretty similar, even some of the older ones up into the newer generation. So I might be able to fill you guys in on some tips. And if you're new to the channel, consider clicking subscribe. I make new videos every week. As always, thanks for watching. I'll talk to you in the next one.